has translated her experience of the traditional nomadic life of Baton Island into hundreds of drawings, prints, and sculptures. That she still has, of course, an absolutely adorable. The left handed man, uh, Jim Houston, and his wife, Alma Houston, who yeah. she's falling asleep right now. Oh, she is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, what should we do? Uh, we have to water. Just... It's an Inuit owned and run company that hires me to be here. And then they go like this, and they go like this, and the wing tip goes touching the, the water. Kaholuk is that particular shorebird. The original drawing is really nice. But we'll see how we can interpret that into, uh, you know, to a print. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just give them drawing paper. If they want to come in and draw on it, then they can stay in here and draw. If not, they can go home. Yeah, Lots of people draw and bring drawings in every day, and they get like twenty-five dollars, fifty dollars. Um, going on 40 years, close. 
So I was already working for Hudson Bay Company. I was approached by um, Terry Ryan, who was already working at, at the uh, Cape Dorset print shop. You know, I'd been uh, trained to buy sculptures and trained to oversee drawings from the artist. Yeah. I'm looking through uh, some of, uh, original drawings and hoping to find an image that we could use for stone cut or other print techniques. So. There's some walrus skulls. Tim Pitulak drew. One of them might be a very good print. And I'm always looking for new artists. I want to demonstrate something over here. Ooh, 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 ooh. And then look. Riding light into the world. And that's a drawing from uh, two weeks. That's on the press right now. Would you have a little having one? Just chicken. Chicken. Can't get any of our country food. Can't get it. ご視聴ありがとうございました<音楽><音楽><音楽><音楽> Taikoa <laughs> I'm not 
たなかったなジュジョンあんまりアポタゴネアマンアウジャオガイマットピチュウナミサラジバケルンタイメットワカタジュジョン She used to do lots of drawing and sometimes carving. I used to help her and、uh, adopt it. I don't talk to her about the last time I'm telling her to do that. We used to live in a post camp back then. You know, in a nomadic society, you, you don't. Make art and carry it around from camp to camp. This is something that came to them with the modern world in the 1950s. They were successful, they had place. 1959, James Houston started his、uh, court. Mr. Jim Houston of the Department of Northern Affairs and National Resources, specifically the Northern Administration Branch. Mr. Houston is from Cape Dorset. At first, we thought only of the cooperative as a hunting and、uh, fishing thing, but、uh, then the prince came along and they seemed to work into the cooperative perfectly, too. So now we, we see that as a possibility for Eskimo women sewing and printing and、uh, hunting and fishing, perhaps many things within this cooperative. We intend to buy boats, many things, better tents, and I hope better housing of them. When you're in a climate like that, your choices are limited. Just keep the people alive, keep the whole thing going, try not to let too many of them die. Houston went up there with a how to book, for heaven's sakes. And there are drawn examples of what product he wanted. This is what you make because this is what I can sell. Inuit art has been kind of blessed and cursed by this since the very beginning. There's no reason to make it other than to be paid for it. I remember my mother doing some crap、uh, to sell to the co op, like duffel socks,、um, some beaded work. <laughs> And、up until then, really, the North was governed by the Hudson Bay Company, the RCMP, and the missions. So, Jim was one of those first Northern service officers. So, he had started this little craft shop in order to find something economic for the Inuit to do. They did all manner of things before they hit on graphics. I was able to get a lot of money. I arrived there in 1960 to become their arts advisor. I was able to get a lot of people 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 to get a lot
They didn't really know what an artist was supposed to be. They only knew that we were taking interest in what they were doing at our request. There was no history endorsement of drawing. I was gone for about four months, traveling by dog team. In the camps, those who had radios, shortwave radios, had heard on the northern broadcast a message from me through two of the Inuit CBC announcers at the time, Andy Pudlow and Mary Pandagusha. And they had let people know you were going to see this apparition arrive with paper and pencil asking to draw. But they didn't quite envision what this meant. So when I did arrive, they'd all rush down. And half the sled, of course, was full with these big pads of paper. So they were amused and laughed and couldn't get over it. Or they took it rather seriously and were intrigued. Of course, the first thing they'd say is, I can't draw. I don't draw. But I simply challenged them to draw. And all the materials were provided by the co-op. But eventually, depending on what you paid people, they quickly figured out that they were being either encouraged or discouraged. In the context of James Houston's North, he gave direction, absolute direction. Terry Ryan came along and gave people choices. Um, <clears throat> The connoisseur group wanted more seals, more igloos. Padlo Pulat didn't want to give them that. His Arctic was changing. And the people knew that. They were moving into these new communities, settlements. And I, they, they really wanted to tell you who they were, and what they were doing, where they came from. And... These are Kananganak, and these really resonate back to the, to the very beginnings of our collection. It was an explanation of what he saw as Inuit tools, and there are beautiful, beautiful engravings. And he did all the animals, all the tools, all the clothing, all separately. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
What he represents is what occurred when he was growing up. There was a lot of change, and he has done drawings depicting the introduction of alcohol and the imposition of religion and these kind of huge changes that came upon Inuit society. Kananganak was the only man that was really around at the time, and he never came in. This was the woman's domain, and they're all older women. And Kanojrak was the queen. If a man and a woman were bringing things in, you were cautious about paying the woman more than the man, because that would be taken back home, and uh, you'd hear about it afterwards. But the, the men, for the most part, would, would think of how successful a hunt had been, or how many caribou you brought home, or how successful you were in hunting down and killing a walrus, and all those things that men are justifiably proud of. The women have alluded to in their drawings or been quite forceful in stating that life in the camp was not easy and that the chores of the women were very demanding. They put up with a lot of abuse. They were better situated to sit down and draw. The women were home, busy, burdened by children, but nonetheless able to engage in this, this business endeavor. It brought cash to the house, whereas the, the man's effort brought food to the house. And young children threw rocks at birds and brought more food home. You know, I mean, that's, that's the structure that people uh, e emerge from. This is by Pallo, man carrying a re reluctant wife. The tradition was, if the, both parents had agreed uh, for that man, the lady didn't really have a choice, you know. So. In May, the geese come back, and when the geese come back, the, the employees leave. I, Ola, who was one of the little print makers in the shop, well, he came to me and announced that uh, they wouldn't be in on Monday, that it's now over for this season. I called the meeting, and they all thought it was a good talk, but they wouldn't be in on Monday. And indeed, they weren't. And they were gone for the season. We just had to make do. Things were really largely dictated to by the season. Stone is very unforgiving material, and you cannot translate great subtlety in stone cut printmaking. So therefore, the advent of stencil printmaking to add a little more subtlety. And then as time goes on, lithography as a means of engaging much more subtlety as it is expressed in the original. I'm here in Ottawa almost maybe two years now, but I used to live in Cape Dorset, 
me and my baby brother, we were near the ice, and I saw a polar bear. He was hiding. Then I got my baby brother to run into a tent. I went in right away, and my mother grabbed my baby brother before he got bite by a polar bear. Annie Pudowitz's breakthroughs are huge. She's the first Inuit artist to have a solo exhibition at a prominent contemporary gallery like the Power Plant, first to have her drawings at Documenta, first to win the Sobe Prize. A uh, Sobe Award. It's, I was shocked. <laughs> Starting to cry, feel good inside my heart. It mean a lot to me. Especially, I lost my baby brother that time, a week after. She has always said that she couldn't draw history, that she could only draw the things that she lived, that she knew. She wasn't trying to pretty things up, it was just speaking from the heart. Terribly troubled life, and her keen ability to transmit that information to people, it's rather frightening. to go eat to our neighbors for whale or seal meat. I miss that with women people around me and just women eating. It's fun to be with elders and you are drawing and they're talking. It's like they're my parents. Eh? They talk to me nice and peace. It's, I miss that. When I go up there, I'm gonna go print shop and sit with elders and draw with them. On the ledger, ledger. The little puppies, we go. Just have it. Yeah, that's it right there, very good. My name is Savina Suna from Kim Joseph. Five names I got. There's Savina Kuluasu Kanazu Itusatsu Ulaike. I mostly remember starting out with my auntie. She encouraged me to draw again. Like she gave me a little piece of paper and then draw, and then you'll find out how much you'll get from down there. So I got 15 bucks for Jimmy, and then gave me a bigger one so that I can draw a bigger. Our knuckle had a piece of big paper, long paper, and he cut it into two pieces, so I took the other one. My brother's face. These are the names that we work with. And this one will be working with her money or his money. So another good year for our division. Well, At least well, June. No, there's nothing there. No. Oh, well, no, 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 no. 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 Um, <laughs> Kaba Valmanami has been working in the print shop for many, many years, translating the images of other artists into prints and at the same time kind of very quietly creating his own archive of drawings. Yeah, it's, very, it's very different from the from down here than it is up north. Yeah.
He's extremely gifted technically, and he's also very formally inventive. Slate. Slate. Slate, Slate from a pool table. From a pool table. A pool table? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He has a very keen environmental awareness, especially with respect to what's happening in the north with global warming and the plight of the polar bears that has been caused by that. Trying to make light of our plight and show tiny humans uh, being engulfed by huge vessels, the smallness of, of humanity versus the vastness of the rest of the world. We got a old tooth in here, different tooth. A lot of the carving is done outside because uh, obviously it produces a phenomenal amount of dust. Same almost, but the shape, they're always different, eh? Some carvers are known for their masterworks, and that's still being carried today. Montreal is a good team. Obama. Obama, Obama. Montreal <laughs> Canadian. These are the most wanted pieces. Mm. <laughs> His work is very well known around the world. This present generation, they're rather proud of the fact that they're recognized as being artists. But I think this is really the first generation to think that. Board in here? Mm -hmm. I think they are trained, you know, they're trained, you know, through their ancestors and growing up in a culture of craftspeople. They're making work that's individual and not just following what has been done before them. I think a lot of people are, are really shocked with the new drawings. They don't really know how to place them. Which is, is what makes them so compelling. Oh, I found a big box of shoes in the bag. She's an amazing, amazing woman. 
to have around just her energy and her you see her working away and every day with Shuvanaya Shuna I've I'm doing an exhibition with her with another artist who lives in Toronto this is me almost drowning it's like a memory in Inu Tutu we want to learn <laughs> at 11 o'clock. <laughs> she really has kind of come to terms of herself as an artist. The line is much more committed and um, the compositions are more sophisticated. She does these aerial views, but then part of the drawing also is a side view so she kind of combines perspective in a really odd way, but yet it, it doesn't look jarring on the paper. You know, someone like Shuvenai is just has that little twist on something that we're not sure what, but that's probably what makes it special. Yeah, coffee time. <laughs> As the printers are printing, they make each plate or stone per each layer. They want to make the gray plate. Mm. No, okay. Open the image file and shut off all the layers except for one. So that's the gray plate. I like to see more color. Okay. Yeah, that one. Uh, okay. And then they proof it. When an addition leaves here, it has paperwork with it that says this is how many hours it took to do this, how many people it took to do it, how many plates, how much paper, how much ink, how much overhead. So we know the cost of producing an addition of 60 prints when it goes south. Like, I like this here, like yellow to white. Mm -hmm. yeah. That one, maybe print that the black eye. Yeah. Yeah. Leave the rest. Dorset Fine Arts is the uh, marketing division of the West Baffin Co-op in Cape Dorset. There's 200 people in the community who carve and 15 to 20 artists who draw on paper and who contribute images to fine art limited edition prints. There was a group of very well-known arts professionals in the early 1960s that came together to advise the cooperatives on the marketing of fine art prints. The idea that you would close off an edition at 50, that the stone would be destroyed, that there would be top quality control, all of those things were started right at the beginning, which is very fortunate for Dorset because had it not, then they might have just been taken as, as a folk art as opposed to, you know, very finely finished prints in the case of the prints or sculpture. The artists get paid over the course of things. So if an artist comes in, does a drawing, they're paid for the drawing. If the drawing is picked for a print, they're paid for that. I should have done it higher. Um, they come in to draw all the plates. They get paid for that. They come in for consultations, they're paid for that. They're paid to sign the editions. And as a perk, they get a, a proof of the final edition after it's sold, so they can then sell it as well. And in addition to the cash that is paid out for artist work, the arts division of the co-op also employs about 15 full and part-time people. Uh, as printmakers, as carving buyers, as packers, as management. That is the mandate of the cooperative to um, provide employment and training. It contributes, oh, about a million dollars or more in direct cash income to people in the community. At the end of the year, if the co-op is profitable, the board of directors, who are elected by the members to represent them, will allocate a portion of the profits to be distributed back to the members in the form of a patronage dividend. Uh, this is kind of an open discussion, um, reviewing the audit statements from Heather. So, welcome all. Uh, basically, my role is to manage the general store, the arts division. 
the other contracts. Well, we've had uh, the recent retirement of officially of Terry, December 31st. It was basically the art side of it is, is going to be a kind of like a new era starting with Terry, you know, moving on. The internal economy that the co-op creates and the, um, the extra income for the people here, it's not replaceable. I had to pay bills, housing bills, heating bills, and electric bills. Sometimes I fall a little behind. There's a lot more money in this town now. Everybody knows what people are doing and who has the money. Because of that, there's a lot of sharing. Uh, there's good and bad share. People weren't as close as they used to be. When they lived in a camp, it was uh, living in a hut or an individual, just no snow house. So you could see the whole family. And the, you, you used to have eye contact and communicate. But as people move into bigger houses with three bedrooms, it became difficult to communicate with them, especially younger generation. It's difficult to feel that you are a young, fully modern person while you live in a settlement. If you're not carving, you're not making art, you're at loose ends. Over the years, as TV came and having alcohol and drugs in the community, you know, a lot of things change, and the, the community got <laughs> He's my real brother. I'm adopted. <laughs> I want to be a cover and work. The co-op started out uh, in 1959 with 26 original members, and now there are close to a thousand. Every adult member of the community is a member of the co-op. And in order to have credit privileges at the store, uh, you have to be a member of the co-op. Running up and down uh, in the garage by itself, if I hook this up? Yeah. Oh, good. good to know. Did this save me uh, how much? 500. 500. Oh, thank you. Thanks a lot. The cost of living in the north is uh, about three times higher because everything is flown in. And what isn't flown in is brought up on the annual ship in the summertime. I'm just the occasional caretaker. When I came here, there was probably 25 artists that were active participants in Stonecut Litho. Uh, and now there's 10 or 12. The co-op doesn't help young artists to become printers. Uh, I'm not seeing that right now. And it's really up to this next generation. You have someone like Chauvinet, who does her thing, and there's a handful of others, but it requires more input. I mean, there's a lot of young talent out there. Life today is very different now with teenagers. They're into, like, music, TV, um, and I don't think they're asking too much from their elders, which would be very nice if they did. Ning TV, she does some beautiful stuff about her son. I'm sitting by myself looking at the iPod, listening to music. My drawings 
They're mostly based on stories that me and Lea used to tell when we were in school. Usually a caribou that's all white, white all over. You can't hunt it. You, you cannot kill it because if you try to follow it, they will just lead you. And the land, it will be like wave after wave of land, and you will get lost. Jutai Tunu was a, a printer assistant here for a long time. All of a sudden rocketed in success with his sculptures. His aesthetic almost seems to be in reaction to the prevailing Cape Dorset sculpture aesthetic. He's a satirist, I think, and a moralist, and he did a print called New Age Christ. He's kind of at war with the world, including his own community and the co-op. And yet he continues to be loyal to it in, in various ways. I've been coming back and forth to this place for years. I keep coming back for some, I don't know why. It's like Mecca. I always feel free here. I read The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Interesting. A thousand years ago, people had an idea about how humans behave. And we still act the same way today. We will still have the same behaviors, same conniving humans. These are little rocks. But it's all there. It was there at the time in my mind. <laughs> Settling into art tends to be something that you do a little bit later. The young artist, you know, almost 40. For here, that's young. We have a huge family here. Whenever I come back with something, I'll bring my aunt some food because I like to help my relatives. That's the way the world should be, help one another. We need food, especially country food here, because that's all we know. Hunt, hunt for food, not hunt for game or hunt for uh, fun. That, I don't like that. And we respect the animals that we hunt. I just hope people understand all over the world. You guys want to watch my movie? That's my father-in-law. You hear that? that gunshot? There's a caribou in the... <laughs> a papa is uh, food in David language. I really, really like to draw a caribou. If I decide to uh, 
not to catch it, I prefer to look at it and observe what I have to fix in my drawing. I want to show people what we do up north. We don't live in igloos. fascinating to see a 50 years later a new generation of Inuit artists pursuing their own visions taking it in some some very different new directions there's nothing first time first time 20 some years of picking the first time I get one I'm gonna take the uh, links geese and TVs it's very nice time. Decided. One, two, one, that one. That one? Yeah. Wally has number four. I'll show you what he wants. <laughs> Wally is a 40. I decided on the boy in the owl. The boy in the owl. Yes. Yeah. I want to get her a nice birthday present. Who else wants to buy print here? We'll take this one. Okay. Over the last five, ten years, a number of the more contemporary or emerging Indian artists, their artwork has been, you know, filled with their own thoughts, their own imaginations, their own pain. That has resonated with a different group of collectors, collectors of contemporary art in general. It's not a regional art, it's not a local art, and I think that while people are making very good art, I think they have a tremendous future, and I'm very excited about it. And the more time I've spent here in Dorset, the more excited I've got. It was hard to convince Powers to be that it was not a primitive art form, it was a contemporary art form. There are a number of young artists coming out of the North today, out of certainly out of Cape Dorset. These young artists are interested in not just the social, political, but certainly about what's happening in the global climate. I think their work is really drawing upon that. No longer do they need to be grouped and exhibited as Inuit artists, but now they're singularly grouped as one person shows or just recently, Shubhanaya Shuna appeared with Sherry Boyle. So I think that is the future of many of these artists who are gonna be shown, not as Inuit artists, but artists who happen to be Inuit. Can you speak to you now for the Budla? Untitled, Fish and Gull, Sea Creatures and Birds. Stone cut here. And we'll start the bidding on this one at, uh, we'll try 600 to start. We were 600 off, 600 I have. 600 off, 600. We deal in secondary collections. These are people who found themselves in the Arctic in the early days, in the 1950s, 1960s, and early 70s. 950. 950, 1,000 on the telephone. I think the early collectors were certainly buying it for love, but it's proven to be a very good investment. 2,200 to my, to my right, then I have 2,200. I'll send advance now at 2,200. 2,400. 2,600. 
individual prices for Inuit prints have been on the rise in recent years. Um, for instance, Niviaxiak's uh, man hunting at a seal hole in the ice. That brought $64,000 in 2008. We have sold to Japan, Germany. It's quite international now. It's a unique, wonderful story and very Canadian. $4,200, then are we finished now at $4,200? $4,200 to the telephone bidder. Fair warning with Janice, $4,200. Last chance, $4,200. $4,200. Tattooed woman. That was done in Montreal, etching, etching in Accurton. He was all along somebody who was beating to his own drum. He'll use Coke bottles or glass on the road. He doesn't care about material being part of a cultural identity. That's my cousin doing from soapstone and marble. I was back in 2006, that's my shorts in Toronto, welding ship. These are uh, made from uh, whalebone at uh, the rib, the sails. I collect them when I walk somewhere in the commute. That's the hand from the acrylic painting. Blue Gwil blubber or seal blubber. He's young enough to be my son and look at the around the eyes wrinkled. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, pick up the wabi medula no more in no color to me. I have to announce to you that I, I am planning to retire officially at the end of July. And then she said, mm, good. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> 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 okay, we may have time. Bye. Bye. Jimmy and I have been together for years. She was my protege, I guess, and it's rather I hadn't expected him to. Plan to leave so soon after I planned to leave. Although a lot of people predicted that. It's a new confrontational role. And it's generally sculpture. Jimmy's had enough of that. This print studio here is by far the longest running print studio in Canada. The continuity of management that Dorset had through Terry Ryan, the benign power for all those years. Yeah, we appreciate him, of course. I did that all night. I, I, I didn't sleep. I didn't sleep.
Inuit don't have a habit of saying goodbye, they have a, a greater habit of saying hello. For someone like Terry to devote uh, so much of his life to that situation is very meaningful. He's there, he's reliable. He's a touch point, you know, it keeps the situation stable. That's been a, a phenomenal asset for Cape Dorset. giving us uh, assistance. We may need someone more. We don't know who will be the resource people that remains to be seen. And leave all. It's pretty hard to say what Jim is going to do. Well, I'll be around. I'm very proud of the community, especially uh, those old artists that has passed away. Yeah. Very nice. These artists are actually keeping their culture alive. They're continuing to document um, their history and write their book. We can look back at all the prints and drawings and sculptures that we've seen over the years. And really, it's the Inuit story. This is who we are and who we were. You know, they've given us a living treasure that will survive them. I think this community has a gift of art. Myself. It's good to have a hand to hold, an unwanted band of gold, an empty bed and torn pages, pictures and frames and souvenirs adorned cages, the sound of my own breathing and sorrow roaring, sun through the window, waking up tomorrow morning, this is a place that once was, that's no longer, pain is what you feel in your bones when you grow stronger, it's well known, it's newborn babies, it's fallen rain, it's knowing you're not alone, knowing we're all in pain. It's your favorite song, it's playing repeatedly Sometimes suffering alone when you need to be It's beautiful, it's ugly, it's both in combination It's staying awake all night long in conversation Cause sometimes the hand held out is what ends the war A second set of shoulders and this is what friends are for Hello, 